Hey, good evening, guys. Hey there. Hi. How you doing? So far, so good. Good, good. I'd do a lot better if the weather up here at the Chabot Space and Science Center would cooperate. Yeah, uh, not not terribly cooperative. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a, May, another one gray. of our yeah. It's a it's a May Day humidity event. Just just doesn't uh, listen. Yeah, so we have ninety seven percent humidity tonight, and at least I'm a hundred percent sure we have ninety seven percent humidity, <laughs> which uh, makes it too humid to open the telescope dome. Uh, but you can admire the telescope, and we're going to have a virtual virtual. Uh, uh, live viewing tonight. Uh, we have a couple of things planned for you. And of course, uh, we'll uh, hopefully engage people with uh, questions and answers as well. Uh, before we get started, my name is Rich Ozer. I'm a volunteer here at the Chabot Space and Science Center, and I'm here with Gerald McKeegan and with John Curry. And uh, we're here for our weekly uh, virtual telescope viewing program that we've been doing now since. Uh, what would you say, February or March of no, 2020, something almost, like that? What almost exactly a year now. Yeah. Almost exactly a year. Okay, yeah, got it. A little bit over a year now. My how time this. flies. Yeah. Yes. So uh, before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the Chabot Space and Science Center is still closed to the public. And we are depending on these virtual programs to keep uh, ourselves engaged with the community. And we appreciate your donations. There is a donation button at the bottom of the Facebook page if you're so inclined. I think you it's at also... the top of the Facebook page, wouldn't you? Well, I'm looking at it right now, and it's at the bottom. So oh, it depends well. on your computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Must on be, there, so depending the on your, dep we'll, we'll put up a chart of operating systems and the position of the <laughs> donation button next week. Yeah, that's and, very important. <laughs> right. And uh, we do count on your donations. And if you would like to visit the website uh, to learn more about the Chabot Space and Science Center, uh, you can visit Chabot Space space.org and we're live tonight on Facebook and on YouTube and I also want to thank our sponsor Fremont Bank uh, who has generously uh, supported Chabot and other community organizations uh, and uh, thank you Fremont Bank. Uh, so tonight like I said we can't open the dome but uh, we could say a little something about uh, the telescope. Uh, I'll slide out of the way here and you can get a look at it. Um, this is our 36 inch uh, research reflecting telescope, uh, fondly known as Nelly. And uh, Nelly is a computer controlled telescope, uh, which is pretty, pretty important for a scope this size and weight. Um, we use it for uh, asteroid, uh, near Earth asteroid research and tracking. We use it for public viewing. Once uh, we start up our public viewing again, you can come visit us and look through this telescope as well as the other telescopes we have. Uh, and uh, it's used for astrophotography as well. So it's a very versatile instrument. It's our newest instrument. It was built in, uh, what was it, 2003? 2003. 2003. 2003 right. oh, thanks, guys. Um, but so it's and only, it's only by 20 years old. Designed yeah. by an engineer here at Chabot Space and Science Center, Kevin that's, Medlock. That's right. So uh, that's the uh, that's the story on Nelly. Um, yeah. So well, uh, part, part of the story on Nelly. Part of part of the story on Nelly. Yes. Story that goes with it, you know. So. So a couple weeks ago, um, we were here with Rick Taft, who uh, has learned how to use the uh, uh, Zoom tools and Facebook tools and YouTube tools, and also uh, learned how to hook up the, his uh, DSLR camera to the telescope. So that way we have more than one person who knows how to do all this stuff. And uh, Rick brought a special camera with him. It's a uh, astronomy uh, DSLR, which means that uh, it's similar to a typical Canon uh, DSLR camera, except this one has a full frame sensor. So it's a really nice high resolution camera, but it's also got the infrared filter removed. And when you buy a DSLR camera at Costco or Best Buy, it has an infrared filter on there so that the infrared light 
just heat coming off of cars and reflecting off of sidewalks doesn't saturate the image and uh, throw the color off of balance. But for astronomers, that infrared filter gets in the way of taking the full spectrum of the object that we're photographing. So Canon and Nikon and other companies actually make astrophotography DSLRs with that filter removed. If you have a standard DSLR camera, you, there are actually companies you could send the camera to that will surgically remove the filter for you. And uh, don't do this on your own. The home surgery kits are a little risky uh, for the DSLRs. Although I have watched YouTube videos about it and I was I almost gave it a go once and then changed my mind. Um, the, uh, but Rick brought that camera and we were taking photos of the Sombrero Galaxy. And uh, Sombrero Galaxy is a uh, fairly low toward the horizon. Um, and it wasn't a great night for seeing. Um, it's also known as M101, which is a Messier uh, no, no, M104, M right? 104, yeah. Yeah, M104, thank you. <laughs> yeah, M101 is a totally different galaxy. Yeah. Um, it's uh, known as M104, which is a Messier uh, designation. Charles Messier lived in the 1700s and was one of the first astronomers to catalog uh, anything that was bright and wasn't a comet. And uh, the, uh, the uh, Messier catalog is uh, a great catalog for uh, interesting uh, astronomical objects that you can see in the urban environment, as well as a catalog of uh, worthwhile in, uh, objects to photograph. So we were on M104, and I'm gonna share my screen to remind people what it is we saw. Excuse me for a second here. Okay. So when Rick was taking the images, they looked something like this. There was a big glowing area in the background and you were seeing some vignetting here, which is uh, caused by the sensor and the camera being a little bit too large for the uh, field of view that's available through the uh, uh, draw tube of the scope. And um, if I zoom in, it's also pretty noisy, right? You see all those speckles, right? That's called noise. And uh, it's because we bump up the ISO, uh, which is the sensitivity of the camera, to a uh, ludicrously large number in order to take these images. Um, and uh, then we go through a process of uh, taking as many images as we can and trying to stack them up in order to beat down the noise and come up with something that is uh, 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 more, you know, representative both artistically and, vi and visually of uh, what we would see if we were looking at this object through the telescope, uh, as well as bring out additional detail that we wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye. So this was a particularly challenging stack of images, and I can give you a sense, while, while we were talking about it, Rick was snapping uh, one image after the next, and he took about 13, 14 uh, images, uh, each at 30 seconds. And you could see, if I animate them, how much the telescope was drifting as he was taking them, right? So he would take these 30 second shots, one after the other. And uh, because we're not actually guiding when we do these presentations, we're not hooking up special guiding equipment to the telescope to have it track and adjust the motor speed while we're photographing, uh, that would just be too involved for this type of program. We have to live with this kind of image drift whenever we're doing uh, a series of photographs. So the first trick whenever you process a stack of images like this is to get them aligned. So you could stack them up and, uh, and actually bring out the detail and beat down the noise. So what he and I were working on during the week, um, it was actually very challenging. Uh, was to get these images to stack up. And in the end, give you a sense of what that looks like. So while you're picking that up, up. Uh, yep. Richard, um, 
Bob Shaw casts, if, if you could use a focal reducer like on a C8 to give a wider field of view? And the answer is yes, you can. In mm -hmm. fact, when we do asteroid research with this telescope, that's exactly what we do. We actually put a focal reducer on there to widen the field of view. Yeah, and certainly that's something we're going to experiment more with. Um, usually when I'm up here by myself, I don't have a full frame camera with me. I'm using uh, what's called an APS-C sensor, which is a little bit smaller, and it doesn't suffer from the vignetting. Uh, when Rick is up here uh, in the same configuration, he'll get the vignetting. So it might be interesting to hook his up to a focal reducer uh, as well as some other camera possibly to a focal reducer. So uh, to be continued, it's a, it's a good suggestion and it's something we've yeah. been thinking about. Yeah. All right, so once we get these aligned, well, how do we align them? Well, the software is sensitive to picking out individual stars. So the best way to align a stack of images is for it to count up and uh, identify the position of all of the stars in each frame and maybe even the core of the galaxy as well um, and figure out how to separate those stars from the noise in the camera so it doesn't get confused between a star and a hot pixel or a star and some other artifact of the photograph. And then it will draw a bunch of triangles or pentagons or uh, octagons and uh, come up with as many of those geometrical shapes as it can, and then try to match them from one image to the next and overlay them properly. So in the end, when the images are all uh, aligned, you'll end up with something like this. You'll notice that instead of the galaxy and the stars drifting from the left to the right, now what you see is the vignette or the you know that whole field of view shifting uh, from right to left, uh, but the stars are aligned and the galaxy is aligned. So each of these are now perfectly aligned and able to be processed further. And after you stack them, what you end up with, I'll bring this out here, is something that looks kind of like this. And it's like, well, that doesn't look terribly good. You can barely see the galaxy, right? You know, let me grow it a little bit here. Um, so you have to start doing things like stretching the image. And when I say stretching the image, I mean changing the light curves so that the dark part of the image is actually considered uh, more important than the rest of the image. And I'll show you exactly what I mean, but I got to get this zoom box out of the way because it keeps getting in the way here. All right, so you have this tool which allows you, and I'll drag this preview in the middle here, which allows you to take the mid range of the image, the mid tones, I could drag that over to the left to brighten up all the detail, and then I could take this dark part and move it a little bit over to the left so it doesn't get washed out and move this a little bit to the left again. And you find just the right balance. Use this along with other tools that uh, allow you to say, oh, I want the core of the galaxy to be brighter, or I want the halo around the core to be brighter. You're able to identify uh, structure sizes and give differential treatment parts of the image. You can make the stars uh, a, a little sharper but not affect the galaxy or make the dust lanes in the galaxy more apparent without uh, causing uh, the stars to uh, get uh, distorted as a result of that. So you play with all of these different software options and in the end, let me close these up, I'll show you what the end result looks like. And I'll show you what Rick came up with, and I'll show you what I came up with, and get the zoom box, which you don't see, but is constantly getting in the way for me. And of course, all of this is in your Basics of Astrophotography volume. Yes, that's volume one, that's that a 7,000 earlier. page volume one, that's right. <laughs> so so uh, Rick's uh, image looked like this. 
out of this same stack that I was just showing you. And he zoomed in quite a bit. And so you can see how kind of big the stars are, and that gives you a sense of how far he zoomed in. Um, I didn't zoom in as much. Um, I just wanted to cut out the vignetting and to uh, get all the distortion on the edges uh, uh, put away uh, so we wouldn't uh, affect the final image. And um, this is the one that I came up with here. Uh, let me get that dragged over here. There we go. So both of us treated it a little bit differently. Rick's is, uh, uh, gives a little more treatment to the halo around the core of the galaxy. You could see just how far this object extends. Uh, and uh, I was more interested in the dust lane and this brightness that's at the top of the disk, which I think is kind of neat looking. Makes, this galaxy looks like a flying saucer to me. I guess it also looks like a sombrero, but it really looks like a flying saucer. Um, so anyway, that was uh, that was our effort from uh, two weeks ago. So a couple of things I'd like to mention about this. Um, first of all, this galaxy, uh, again, it's called M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. It's about 50 million, mi or 50 million light years away from us. And it's what we call an active Gal gal active galactic uh, nucleus, a AGN galaxy. Um, it has a very large black hole at the center of it, which is an active black hole, which means it's actually consuming material, unlike the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, which is not consuming anything. Um, the black hole at the center of uh, the Sombrero Galaxy is actually consuming material and that is producing a lot more uh, radiation and energy. Um, and it's much more massive than the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And so it, it kind of looks like a cross between an elliptical galaxy and a spiral galaxy. It is in fact a spiral galaxy, but it is an uh, active galactic nucleus uh, type of galaxy. So, one so you can really consider this a, to be in a transitional state. Right, right. Right, because, you know, galaxies are classified according to uh, those uh, uh, features that Gerald was just alluding to. So you have spiral galaxies and you have elliptical galaxies. And elliptical galaxies, you no longer can visually see the spirals anymore. They look more like a, you know, kind of like a blob, right? They're, they're uh, you know, cotton balls in the sky. And uh, uh, there, this is an intermediate state between the two. So galaxies evolve from one to the other. Um, Gerald, you may want to, uh, your mic is a little bit low, so you may want to move that a little closer to you. There you go. How's this? Oh, much better. Great. Okay, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, all right, well, that's it for the Sombrero. By the way, for those of you who are interested, uh, that's a piece of software uh, uh, called Pix Insight. That's P-I-X Insight, and it's kind of the go-to Swiss Army knife tool these days for astrophotographers to do image processing. Oh, that's a great image of it. This uh, is a Hubble yeah. Space Telescope image, yeah. so. Yeah. No fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's fair, you know. But, but you know, in all of these images, the ones you were looking at and the Hubble image, you can see how bright the central mm -hmm. part of it is, and that's because of, right. of that very active black hole at the center. Uh, yeah. Well, that's the difference. Uh, I mean, there's big differences there. I mean, if you if you move your telescope into space, you'll get a much better image. And uh, <laughs> uh, also, ours was a grand total of uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was uh, five minutes of exposure time. That Hubble image, I'm not quite sure how much time that was. Several I'm hours. Sure, I'm yeah. sure it was more than five minutes. And, yeah. and it's a uh, eight-foot mirror instead of a three-foot mirror. And right. It's, it, they've got a few advantages. A couple yeah. of advantages. So I think we did pretty well <laughs> considering. Yeah. 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 And if you move your telescope into space, it's a lot longer to set it up and tear it down. <laughs> and, it, and it's a real drag if you forgot something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about elliptical galaxies. But before we do, uh, I just wanted to mention something that some of you may have heard. Uh, astronaut Michael Collins passed away. Yeah. 
a couple of days ago. I believe it was on April 28th. Michael Collins was the third astronaut in the Apollo 11 mission. We hear a lot about the two that actually went down to the surface of the moon, uh, Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. But Michael Collins is the guy that had to stay in the, uh, the command module capsule and continue orbiting around the moon while those two guys were having all the fun down on the surface of the moon. Um, and, you know, there's, there's something interesting to think about. Uh, he was alone in that spacecraft. And as it orbited around the moon, there was a period of time when he was on the backside of the moon. When he's on the backside of the moon, he cannot talk to anybody on Earth. He's 240 million or 240,000 miles away from the Earth. And he can't talk to the astronauts down on the ground because they're on the opposite side of the moon. So he, when he was on the back side of the moon, he was truly alone. I mean, completely isolated from any other human being on Earth. And sometimes when you just think about that, that's kind of actually scary a little bit. The guy, you know, I, I was, I was, nerves of steel. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was eight years old uh, during the uh, moonshot, and what you just described, I remember that making a huge impression on me. Yeah. At at the time, because I I think that you know Walter Cronkite and others who were covering it made a point of of letting everybody know that that was the reality of the situation. Yeah. And it yeah. made a huge impression on me as a kid. And uh, I think about that all the time. Well, and then not only that, but, you know, there was no guarantee that uh, Armstrong and Aldrin were going to make it back to the command module. You know, they were down on the surface and if anything went wrong and they weren't able to launch off the surface, that was it. They were going to be stuck there. And Collins would have had to make the flight back to the earth alone. So, you know, he really had to have a um, pretty steady personality to do that. So yeah. I just think that's really cool. He's, he's kind of, in my mind, one of the really unsung heroes of that mission because, you know, yeah. You know, and he had a lot, of, a lot of work to do. He was supposed to be taking photographs. He was trying to find the uh, the uh, lander on the, on the surface uh, because of some problems that, that they had during the descent. They didn't actually land where they had originally planned. So he was trying to find them. Uh, plus, he had all these photographs and other things he was supposed to be doing while he was all by himself in that spacecraft. So pretty neat and he has passed away so now buzz aldrin is the only surviving member of the apollo 11 crew yeah. hmm. all right well thanks for that Good so memorial for him. richard we were talking a little while ago about elliptical galaxies and and we talked a little bit last week about elliptical galaxies and about uh how the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are drifting toward each other and in about two or three billion years, they're going to merge. And I described how that merger is gonna be very chaotic. And when it's all over with, the two spiral galaxies, when they have merged, will form an elliptical galaxy. And someone asked, well, you know, why is that? Why doesn't it just form a, a spiral galaxy? And I don't think I gave a very good answer. And, it, you know, it has to do with the, the chaos involved <clears throat> in uh, the collision. You know, the stars in the Milky Way are all orbiting in basically the same direction in, around the, uh, the center of the, of the galaxy. Uh, there's a flat disk and all the stars in the disk are orbiting around in the, in the same direction. Same thing is true with the Andromeda galaxy. And if you disrupt that, if you send the stars all going every which way, uh, you, you lose that, that rotation. You know, and that rotation is left over from mm -hmm. when the galaxy was forming. It was formed out of a huge cloud of gas and dust as that cloud of gas and dust condensed it began to uh, rotate and that rotation remained with it even as it shrunk down and formed that flat disk 
So uh, I, I was thinking about it over the week, and I remembered seeing an animation done by the Space Telescope Science Institute. There are the people who actually run the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And I remember seeing an animation that they had done several years ago. Um, turns out it was almost 20 years ago, um, showing uh, what happens. They actually uh, kind of computerized a con collision between two galaxies uh, and had the computer compute moment by moment, actually year by year, I guess you'd say, what would happen, how would the two galaxies uh, interact with each other, what would be the influence of the gravity of the two galaxies and so on to show what the collision might look like. And so I was able to download that animation and I just wanted to share it with you. This is pretty cool. Yeah, this is uh, pretty neat. So, so here are the two galaxies. And as they drift toward each other, you know, one of the interesting things is, is that Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are at angles to each other. And as they merge and begin to merge, they tear each other apart. And stars start flying every which way. The, the central cores want to kind of pull together and they eventually will. But the stars have just been thrown every which way so you no longer have stars all orbiting all in the same direction and, and so forth and you have a much bigger galaxy and and the end result of all of this is that when when a lot of the stars will be actually ejected completely but the ones that remain they will kind of come together but they'll be orbiting in all kinds of different directions and it will be a much more elliptical galaxy rather than a spiral galaxy like uh, they are today, all right? So anyway, I, I found that animation. There's actually several of them uh, around to that, that show what this would be like, what it would be like. And, you know, you might wonder, well, okay, that's just a computer anim animation. How do we know that that's what it really will look like? Well, it turns out there are galaxies out there that are in the process of colliding right now. And I've got a great Hubble Space Telescope image of two galaxies actually in the process. And you'll be surprised to see that it looks a lot like what the animation just showed. So here we go, all right? We call this formation the mice. And what this is are two galaxies in the process of merging. Looks an awful lot like the animation. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is relatively, you know, they, they haven't fully merged yet. They're still in the process. But you can see already that they're starting to tear each other apart. And stars are going to go flying every which way. <laughs> a lot of the stars will be ejected completely. And what remains will be this just jumble of stars going every which way. And you'll end up with an elliptical galaxy. Uh, now, what, one of the interesting things is, you know, you got billions and billions, hundreds of billions of stars between these two galaxies. And you would think with this kind of a merger, they're all going to bump into each other. But it turns out the space between stars is huge. And most of these stars will never come in contact with each other. Uh, they will just slip by each other. There will be gravitational interactions but there will be relatively few collisions. Lots of, uh, you know, changed orbits and ejected stars and things like that, but very few collisions. And of course, the, the cores, the black holes that form the core of each of these galaxies, eventually those black holes will merge and they'll end up with a much larger uh, black hole at the center uh, surrounded by this swarm of galaxies in more of an elliptical galaxy shape. Uh, that's a swarm a, of stars rather than an elliptical galaxy shape. That's a great lead in to, to a, a very good question that's out there on Facebook. Uh, if the black hole in the sombrero galaxy is active and light disappears, why is it so bright at the middle? 
It's not the black oh, hole. Those, those, the are, those, those are surrounding. Those are stars that are surrounding the black hole. We we cannot see a black hole, and anything that gets uh, quote unquote swallowed by a black hole uh, is gone from uh, the visible universe uh, uh, forever. But uh, the uh, the, the material that is in orbit around the black hole and that has been attracted gravitationally to that region of space is glowing brighter and brighter yes. as yeah. more material uh, is concentrated in that area. And, uh, uh, and, and it's a very energetic part of, uh, of any galaxy. So what you're yeah. seeing is evidence of a black hole there, not the black hole itself. Right, right. Yeah, the black hole... And, you know, one of the things you got to understand about the black hole is it, it it's truly like a, a hole. It's not a thing. The thing is the singularity at the center that is surrounded by a region of space that that there is stuff in that region of space, but you can't see it because within a certain distance from the singularity, light cannot escape. So anything that goes on closer than what we call the event horizon it's happening. There's stuff going on there, but we can't see it. But what we can see is what's happening outside of the event horizon, which is where stuff is being sucked in towards the um, the black hole. It's spinning around in a in an accretion disk. Uh, it's extremely violent. Uh, it generates a lot of heat, a lot of radiation. Um, and we can see all that. And so that's what that glow is that we see, plus all the other stuff that's in close proximity to it that's actually not part of that accretion process, but it's close enough to where the combined light produces that bright glow. So, you know, I was thinking about that, uh, uh, that animation you were showing before, and it, it made me realize that, uh, you know, that if you study fluid dynamics, it, it, things look like that, you know. When you're, it, it, you can almost think that that, that type of behavior um, uh, that fluids have when they're interacting with one another extends all the way out to uh, very large structures in the universe where gravity is essentially acting uh, the same way as a fluid would, and uh, the way these things were flowing around one another. Uh, there's some good black hole questions coming up. Oh, yeah, really? black, black holes always attract a lot of questions. I'm not sure why. Uh, Andy <laughs> says, would a collision make the black hole big enough to go Nova? Uh, no. Uh, no, unfortunately <laughs> not. It, nothing is going to make it blow up anymore. It's yeah. just going to make it a, a, more, a stronger black hole, yep, a right. more massive black hole. And more massive, yes. Yeah. So, And all the mass is concentrated at the singularity. Yeah. But uh, as it turns out, if you do the math, the diameter of the black hole is directly proportional to the mass of the black hole. So if you double the mass of the black hole, you double the diameter of the uh, event horizon, the region around it, the actual hole. So double the mass of the singularity, you double the size of the black hole. And if you triple it, you, the mass of the singularity, you triple the size of the, the black hole. And here's another kind of subtle one. Uh, why do black holes eject radiation, but not light? Well, light is radiation. Uh, and, and, and it, it, they don't really eject it from the black hole itself. Might want to yeah. elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's the black hole. Anything that happens on the inside of the black hole, whether it generates radiation or light or infrared or anything like that, we don't see it, we don't detect it because it's inside the event horizon. But there's all this stuff going on just outside the event horizon. All this material, you know, leftover stars or leftovers from stars and gas and dust and everything that's being crunched by the powerful gravity of the black hole. And that is what is producing all of the light and the radiation and the heat and so forth. That is what we see when we see a black hole. Uh, I'm going to try to find that image that they did. Oh, the stars orbiting. Uh... Well, no, there's there was an image that we did. Um... Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the um, the uh, Berkeley. Uh... Yeah, yeah, they took Berkeley, an image yeah. of of a 
black hole in, yeah. in M82. Right. All I got to do is find it. <laughs> so you guys uh, talk while I look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all sitting here looking for that. Uh, it wasn't M82. It was, was M, it 82 uh, or 87? Yeah, it was uh, yeah, M87. 87. Right. 87, yeah, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. M87 black hole is the good search term. I got it here. All right, hold on. Let me open this up. See if I could. Oh, I got my image of it. All right, go ahead and share it. I got the one no, with the magnetic the... lines. Yeah, we want yeah. the one with the magnetic lines. All right, I've got yeah. that. I'll share it right now. We have the we have the uh, the yeah. Google search race here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So so help me out here a little bit, Richard. You see this bright donut around yep. a dark region. Okay, mm -hmm. the dark region at the center is the black hole. And again, that's just a space around the singularity. The singularity is where all the mass is. There's a space around it where no light can escape. But outside the, the singular or the event horizon um, is where all this material is being pulled into the black hole. And it is being spun around a black hole at a very high velocity. Stuff is banging into each other, generating stretched huge, out horribly. Stretched them out, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and this creates a lot of heat and a lot of energy, including radiation, uh, you know, X-ray radiation, uh, bright light, uh, infrared, all of that. And so that's what we detect. We don't see inside the black hole, but we do see just outside in what's called the accretion disk. And so this is an actual image of the accretion disk around the black hole at the center of uh, the galaxy M87. Now, the, uh, the other thing about this particular, uh, this was a second go at the data. And this particular image is also showing uh, you'll notice uh, that there are striations that are spiraling out from uh, the region that is uh, 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 dark and is, you know, the, where the black hole is. But those striations are magnetic field lines. And you can see how all of the energy is spiraling in towards the event horizon of the black hole. And that was a real exciting uh, uh discovery in the data uh, to be able to actually tease out uh, magnetic field lines. A crazy place. You don't want to be there. No, don't, <laughs> and, and, and don't, don't step into one or step on one. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to acknowledge um, one of our, our <laughs> I'm starting to think she's one of our favorite fans, is a little girl named Stephanie. Her mother's name is Erica. And Stephanie uh, is, I, I think she's <laughs> six or seven years old. And she seems to really enjoy these shows. And she often <laughs> asks questions through her mother and so on. Anyway, Stephanie says hi to all of us. So <laughs> hi, Stephanie. Yeah, I saw that. That's that's sweet. <laughs> hi, Stephanie. Uh, and, uh, and little V thinks the Hubble... Uh, picture of the sombrero looks like a giant onion ring. So all I can think about right now are onion rings as a result of this comment. <laughs> so I think I know where, what I'm getting afterwards. <laughs> well, it's also compared to the eye of Sauron. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's the other thing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all, right all right. Well, what else we got to talk about tonight? Um, I am uh, looking through the questions here. You know, we, we got some questions last week, uh, actually a week and a half ago, I think it was, that I got some questions from uh, Janik Mocker, who is one of our board members. Oh, right. Yeah. And most of her questions were about moons and about the moon and so on. Now, unfortunately, the moon is not up tonight. So even if we could look through the telescopes, we wouldn't be able to look at the moon. It won't rise until I think just after midnight tonight. It's a waning gibbous moon. 
Uh, but, you know, she asks a couple of questions. One of the questions she asks is, why does the moon appear to change size over the course of the night? It appears to be much bigger when it's close to the horizon. That's a great question. Than, than when that it's, is. you know, high up in the sky. And the, the answer is, it actually is just the opposite. Um, the, the moon does not change size. Uh, it's the same size, whether it's near the horizon or high up in the sky. The reason it looks larger near the horizon is because you have something to compare it to. Mm -hmm. It's close to the horizon. You can see the horizon. You know, there's distant trees and buildings and things. And so you have something to compare it to. When it's high up in the sky, you don't have anything to compare it to. But in reality, it's actually a little bit bigger when it's high above you than when it's at the horizon. And the reason for that is when it's at the horizon, the part of the earth that you're standing on is actually turned mm -hmm. away from the moon. And when it's almost straight overhead, that part of the earth that you're standing on has now rotated around and is directly below the moon. So you're actually a little bit closer when the moon is high up in the sky than when it's close to the horizon. So it actually is a tiny bit big, bigger in, in terms of how it looks to your eye than when it's close to the horizon. So it's, now, now you can prove this to yourself. I know that, you know, all our lives we, we, we look at the moon towards the horizon and we say, oh, look at that giant moon at the horizon. And then four hours later, it's like, oh, now it's back to the normal moon size, right? And it's, it's this optical illusion that's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't unsee it, right? It's just, uh, always like that. You get so people you, that, that swear that so, it absolutely yeah. is bigger when it's at so the horizon. Take, take an index card, right? And get a hole puncher that's got, that punches a round hole. And when the moon is at the horizon, hold the card away from your eye until the hole and the moon are essentially at the same size, right? And make note of how far away you're holding it. Have a little ruler with you or a tape measure or whatever. So you're holding the card out like this and you have a measurement of how far away it is and then wait until the moon is straight up above you and do the same thing and the card is going to be at exactly the same spot as it was when you were looking at the horizon now this is true except it'll be higher up except you'll yeah. be like up this. over your yeah. head yes so yes. don't I, fall right <laughs> yeah. and, and, and don't do this out in the middle of the street because your neighbors are going to wonder what yeah. The heck? yeah yeah they'll call the police <laughs> now this 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 is true on any given night so on yeah. a given night right the size of the moon when it's close to the horizon or whether it's high in the sky it's the same but during the course of the month the size of the moon does change because the moon's orbit around the sun or around the earth is not a perfect circle it's an ellipse so there are some times when the moon is farther away from the other. And there's actually quite a bit of difference. I think the closest it gets is about 200 and, or I'm sorry, yeah, 222,000 miles away. And the farthest is about 254,000. Don't quote me on those exact numbers, but that's roughly the, the range between when it's closest and when it's farthest away. And because of that, during the course of the month, the size of the moon, as we see it from the Earth, will change. Sometimes it'll be bigger, and sometimes it'll be smaller. And this is now, why we have what they call super moons. Exactly. So if, if it happens to be that full moon occurs at the same time that the moon is closest to the Earth, we call that the official name is a perigean full moon because the point when it's closest to the earth is called perigee. So the official astronomical name is perigean full moon, but everybody calls it a super moon. So New, news people started that and uh, took off. Yep. Yeah. So we actually will have a super moon this month in May. It'll be on the night of uh, the 25th slash 26th uh, that night. 
And <laughs> we'll have an eclipse that night as well, a total lunar eclipse. So early in the morning of uh, May 26th, and I mean really early in the morning, um, the moon is going to slip into the shadow of the earth. And it first starts entering the shadow of the earth at about 1.47 in the morning Pacific daylight time. It won't get into the darker part of the shadow, though, until about an hour later. So the, the shadow of the Earth is actually two concentric uh, disks, if you will. There's an outer one called a penumbra, which is a very light shadow. And then there's an inner one, which is called the umbra. It's a much darker shadow. It is rusty red in color. Um, and so the moon will slip into the penumbra first at about 1.47 uh, a.m. on the 26th, and it will then slide into the Umbra at about, I think it's uh, 244 is when it first starts to enter the Umbra. And when it fully enters the Umbra, that's when we see what people like to call a blood moon, where the moon looks rusty red in color, dark rusty red in color. Uh, now, the the shadow of the moon, the umbra, is much bigger than the moon. So sometimes the moon passes straight through the umbra, but sometimes it passes through the upper part or the lower part of the umbra. And this time around, it's going to pass through the upper part of the umbra. So it's actually going to be in totality only for a very short period of time. I think it's only 11 minutes. Um, so you got to catch it while you can. Um, but you have to stay up really late or really early, depending on how you will, want to look at it. For those of us in the West Coast, the moon will have gone through totality, but it will still be partially in the umbra when it reaches the uh, western horizon, when it starts to set on the western horizon, which is also when the sun is just about to come up. So, uh, you know, it's it's going to be an all-nighter for those of us who are going to watch it, and we will be covering it here at Chabot. We are going to uh, have at least one camera on one telescope and maybe a couple of them, uh, and we will be uh, viewing it. And we will invite you to uh, join us for an all-nighter to, to watch the eclipse. Um, I want to respond to a uh, question. Let me see who asked it. Uh, here it is. It's from Isabel. Uh, oh, hi. This is. It's not from Isabel. It's from Christian, who's using his mom's phone. Uh, it says, hi, this is Christian, and I'm using my mom's phone. What is the best image, image of Messier 1? that you have ever done. Um, I've been looking for an opportunity to shoot M1 for a long time. And it's never, the, the, the combination of circumstance and weather has never panned out. But I do want to share an image from one of our EAS, uh, East Bay Astronomical Society club members. Uh, and she is a phenomenal astrophotographer and a uh, astrophysics student as well at, uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, her name is Molly Wakeling. And she posted very recently uh, this fantastic image of M1 uh, and did it here in the Bay Area. Um, and you could see an awful lot of detail there, uh, all the knots and uh, uh, different, different types of uh, 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 gases that are uh, involved in, in the object. Uh, this is a narrow band image, meaning that it's got, you know, she uses special filters to bring out uh, detail in the hydrogen spectrum, uh, the oxygen spectrum, and uh, uh, the sulfur uh, spectrum. And uh, I just think this is one of the best M1 photos I've seen. It's one of the better, best yeah. M1 images I've ever seen, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. M1 yeah. is the remains of a supernova explosion, which, you know, basically all but destroys the star that's exploding and just blows the guts of it all over the place. And that's exactly what this looks like. Yep. And it, it has expanded out so far and it's, it's become a very dim faint object that you can just barely. 
Now, it has a rather exotic uh, core as well, right? Yeah. It's got a, a neutron star at the center. Yeah. The remains yeah. of uh, this explosion is a neutron star, and it spins, and it spins very quickly. And uh, every time it makes a rotation, it sends a radio burst that we can detect with a radio telescope. And we call that type of object a pulsar. Yeah. And uh, every pulsar has its own timing because not everything spins at the same rate in the universe. Everything has its own rate of spin. And uh, there's 33 uh, and, and a third. And there's yeah, 33 and 45. <laughs> this one is a 78. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so every pulsar has its own radio signature. And you, uh, you guys are giving away your ages. You yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's for sure. I, I, I've given up. Going, I've, what are I, they talking about? I've, I've pretty much given up. <laughs> now well, I'll you, just blab you, about my 78 records. You know, we, we, say, we say this is the remnant of a supernova explosion. If you happen to have been al alive, speaking of being old, if you happen to have been alive in the year 1054, you would have seen the supernova explosion that caused the M1 uh, Crab Nebula. Um, the star exploded, or we s would have seen it explode in the year 1054. People saw it. It was bright enough to be seen in the daytime. Uh, of course, at that time, nobody knew what it was, so they just thought it was some the formation of a new star in the sky. Um, but there are several uh, re uh, recorded uh, observations that people made of what they thought was a new star in the sky that was so bright it could be seen in the daytime. And that was the explosion of the super, what became uh, the Crab Nebula. And there was a question that I was going to respond to, and I, I missed it. It was on YouTube. Um, but when we were talking about the collision of um, uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda, and May asked, well, what will happen to all the constellations? Will we still have the same constellations mm -hmm. in the sky? Good question. And the answer is, no, we no. won't. <laughs> uh, all of the stars that you see with your naked eye, which are the stars that make up the constellation, those are all stars within our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, you can't, with your naked eye, see stars in other galaxies. You only see stars in our own galaxy and only stars that are relatively close to us. Because the galaxy will be so disrupted, all of those stars will go every which way. And the net effect will be, we'll have to learn a whole new set of constellations when it's all over and done with. Um, so well, the, answer the fortunate thing is, though, it'll take such a long time that generations of people will just learn different constellations. Yeah, but can you imagine being being a star mapper, somebody trying to make star charts, and every year they got to do a new one because things are just going haywire. You know? so, all right. It'll be boom times for the star <laughs> map makers. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, what else we got out there? Any other questions coming in? Now's the time to get us, folks. Yeah, that's right. Don't forget also to hit that donate button if you have a minute. Uh, we really could use your support. Uh, you know, the, yeah. in addition to doing the virtual telescope programming, we do a lot of other uh, virtual programming uh, during the week. Uh, some of it we do for schools. We're also uh, doing work here at Chabo to get ourselves ready for the reopening. We are actually going to have new exhibits. Uh, we're reconfiguring the front entrance area and doing a lot of things to get ourselves ready for a reopening. And some of you may have heard that the Chabot Space and Science Center is partnering with the NASA Ames Research Center in uh, the, the Silicon Valley. And we are going to be a partner with them. In fact, we will become 
the visitor center for the uh, NASA Ames Research Center. And we're gonna create what we call the NASA experience. So you'll be able to come up to Chabot and not only see the, the typical things like the planetarium and the telescopes that you've seen in the past at Chabot, you'll also see a lot of exhibits highlighting the research that they're doing at Ames Research Center. Uh, they'll be sharing some of their artifacts with us. So we'll have those to look at as new exhibits. Um, they'll also be uh, working with Chabot education staff to develop programming for schools and, and outreach for the community and everything. So we are really looking forward to this new partnership with NASA uh, Ames Research Center. And, and our grand opening is going to be in November. And, uh, you know, we, we still need your support. So if you want to click on that donate button uh, on Facebook, um, or you can go to the Chabot website, which is ChabotSpace.org. And when you get there, you'll see a donate button at the top of the page. Click on that and help us out any way you can. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Tim stole my joke. <laughs> Somebody asked, uh, is plan uh, uh, Deb, Deb Dada uh, uh, asked, is Planet Nine really a black hole? And I was going to say, well, if you ask Gerald, Planet Nine is Pluto. And then uh, <laughs> Tim Thompson uh, said, Planet Nine is called Pluto. But uh, to, on a more serious note, the reason it's a question is because there's a lot of um, uh, uh, hypothesizing that there is a planet beyond the orbit of Pluto or somewhere out in that region of the solar system that we have not found yet that may explain some poorly uh, uh, planet understood, X. yeah, planet X. Some poorly <laughs> understood aspects of the outer planets' orbits, yeah. and everything has been speculated. You know, there's a large gas giant floating out there, but it's so far we can't see it. Maybe it's a micro black hole, so we don't see it because it's so small but massive. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of you know, you can invent all kinds of. Uh, uh, possible causes for this. And uh, and then the latest theories are, oh, there's really nothing anomalous about the orbits at all. If you model them this way, then you would expect the types of observations that we see. So um, really, the answer is nobody knows, right? Oh, no. so, I mean, we, we, it, it's probably the simplest answer is that the orbits can be explained by the bodies that we've already identified. Um, and yes, it's possible that there are, it, there are other large chunks of rock out there a black hole i don't know that would that would be um uh uh, uh kind of a, a great uh uh sci-fi explanation but there's no evidence yeah, I, to I, suggest I, that that is the that is the cause of anything or that there's one sitting out there yeah one other possibility though is it's not a black hole it's a brown dwarf uh, right a brown dwarf is a failed star it's a it's, it's an object that uh, started the formation process that a star goes through but it never accumulated enough mass to actually start the fusion process mm -hmm. at the center of the star which is what drives a star so it's it's hot but it's not so hot that it can actually cause fusion. So you don't get very much light at all. Um, so the term we use is a brown dwarf. And it is quite possible for there to be brown dwarfs out there that we can't see because right. they're not putting out enough light. But they're out there and, you know, they're going to interact gravitationally with other stars and planets and so on. So that's it's another much, possibility. It, yeah, and it's a much more likely explanation than a black hole. I mean, if you think about it, a black hole, the origins of a black hole are very energetic and very obvious, right? They don't just spontaneously form in the middle of deep space uh, without there having been a galactic core or a supernova or, well, you know, a globular cluster. And Let me and interrupt the, you there for a yeah. second. Um, there, there used to be a lot of talk about primordial black holes. Has that kind of gone out of uh, 
well, no one's no one's found one. Yeah, <laughs> no one's found one. So if for it to be a black hole, it would have to be one of these primordial black holes that was not moving relative to our solar system fast enough to escape the the sun's gravitational influence. It and would have mass... to have, it would have had to have fallen into a gentle orbit around the sun yeah. to influence the orbits of the planets that we know about. But and if the, the if odds of really... that are very low. If there really were primordial black holes, they could be small enough that that could happen. Well, they're in but... my garage. <laughs> they're in your garage. That's why I can't well, find sweep out the garage, my, will you? I can't I, find I, any of my tools. I think I think <laughs> you guys are working on your next science fiction book. Yeah, I, mean, I always am working yeah. on my next comedy hey, uh, science fiction. Uh, there was a there was a question I saw. Somebody asked, "What is the focal length of Nelly?" Oh, so, good question. The focal length of, of Nelly is 7,315 millimeters um, or 7.3 meters, depending on how you want to measure it. Um, so that's the, the distance from the primary mirror, which is at the bottom of the telescope, to the focal point of the telescope, which is just in front of the eyepiece. Um, so the way Nelly works, it's a reflecting telescope. So it actually has two mirrors inside of it. There's a big one at the base of the telescope. Uh, you can see behind Richard there, um, you can see where the eyepiece is and just above it, you see what looks like a little yellow uh, partial rings around it. Those are the counterweights. That's where the uh, primary mirror is. It's just inside the telescope there. It's 36 inches in diameter. At the front of the telescope is a smaller mirror and light comes in the, the front of the telescope, hits the big mirror, bounces off because that big mirror is curved. It bounces off as a cone of light that hits the front mirror, bounces off of it, back down through a hole in the primary mirror to the, where the eyepiece. So the path of light inside the telescope is folded, but the t combined length is 7.3 meters or 7,315 uh, millimeters. Now I say that's the combined length. It's actually the effective length because the curvature of the two mirrors is slightly different. Uh, it actually extends it. So it's not like you're reflecting off a flat mirror. You're reflecting off curved mirrors. Mm -hmm. And so you get, um, get an extension of the the cone of light. So the effective focal length of the of the telescope is 7,315 millimeters, which is about 24 feet for those of you who are metrically challenged. <laughs> so, so and, and for those of you who like focal ratios, it's an F8. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then there's a, another question here. How's the light pollution around Chabot? Uh, Stephen mm. says he he saw our, our film last week. Uh, oh, we thanks about, for watching that. Yeah, yeah, yeah about Good we film. did a, the, uh, a film. It's a documentary that was produced by a, a, a young guy who got interested in, in, uh, in light pollution. And he shot some of it up here at Chabot. And so the question is, how's uh, the light pollution here at Chabot? It's as bad this week as it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> last week, it's a lot worse than it was 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, one of the things we do is we use this telescope to track near-Earth asteroids. Uh, to do that, we have to be able to measure how bright they are. And we have to pick out sometimes asteroids that are very faint compared to the background. And so one of the things we do is we actually measure the darkness of the background. And there has been a one full magnitude increase in the brightness of the background over the past 10 years. Now, uh, in our magnitude system uh, that astronomers use, the one uh, magnitude difference represents two and a half times brightness difference. So it's kind of a screwy system that we have for doing that. But uh, if something is magnitude one, it's two and a half times brighter than something that's magnitude two. So when I say there's a one magnitude increase in the brightness, that means that the background sky today is two and a half times brighter than it was 10 years ago here at Chabot. And uh, it's getting worse. So. 
Uh, Tim wants to know who Nelly uh, is named after. Ah, <laughs> good question. Nelly is named after the daughter and grandmother. Do I have that right? Yes, daughter yes, and grandmother right. <laughs> of Merrill Martin. Merrill Martin is a gentleman who donated quite a bit of money to help build the uh, telescope here, the build Nelly. And uh, because he donated so much of the money, he got, got the naming rights. So his daughter and his grandmother are both named Nelly. So he named it after his daughter and grandmother. And the, uh, the building is a, the Merrill Martin Observatory. Right. 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 He's got a plaque right outside. Which is a test for our volunteers. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and probably everybody's wondering, well, you know, you have Rachel and Leah. I don't remember uh, Nelly being a biblical cat and character. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's been an hour here. It so has. Uh, I'll just check and see if there are any other questions real fast. Uh, I think that's about it. So. It is. All right. Thanks all for joining us tonight. Yeah. yeah. Pray well, for yeah. pray for clear skies next week. Yeah, yeah. And we'll keep we'll keep dry, dry weather too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we're getting into the time of the year where we get a lot of uh, nighttime uh, fog uh, rolling in all across the bay, and that means that uh, our opportunities for observing are going to not be as great as they were two months ago. So. Yeah, but we'll always come up with something interesting. So, yep. Uh, we'll try. Yeah. Come on back. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm learning to play the guitar, so pretty soon, you know, I'll be able to. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, oh, those are, We're yeah, all in trouble. That's when I'll get uh, Rick to come in and uh, do, do the. Uh... <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good night, everybody. And once again, please, if you uh, take a moment to either go to the Chabot, uh, space org website or uh, click on the uh, donate button on Facebook and help us out. We really appreciate it. Good night. All right. Definitely. And good we'll night see all. you next week. Have yep. a good weekend.